12 years okay. is how long I've had my company, Bread Truck Films, which is like focus on design films. Mm -hmm. uh, and then before that, I kind of have a checkered past. It's a, a checkered history of working in architecture, then working in the LA film industry, then working in documentaries and going back to design. So I've been out of school about 20 years. The first 10 years is like a mishmash of architecture and film production work. And the last 10 years has kind of been on my own, focusing on design documentaries uh, specifically. That's the, the fascinating aspect is that, so you have a, a degree in architecture, right? From Berkeley? That's right. Yep. 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 Up by you guys. When I got my degree, I had taken a film class in my final semester just to fulfill some electives, right? Like, all right. Let's just take this class. And man, it hit. I fell in love with filmmaking right away. There's something about it. It was like architecture combines all these different art forms, you know, like interiors, lighting, color, structure, space. Filmmaking is kind of the same way. It's very complex. So I think that's why I was attracted to it. Filmmaking is fashion, it's theater, it's photography, it's wardrobe, it's makeup, it's, you know, lighting. So... I, I think I just gravitated towards the complexity and towards these, these are kind of like, they call it the mother of the arts, you know, where you combine all different artists together to produce these really big complex projects. So after that, I said, I'm out of architecture just after, <laughs> after spending five years getting a degree. <laughs> all it took was that one class. <laughs> I took one lousy elective class at the end. It was taught by, it wasn't even taught by a filmmaker, it was taught by an English teacher and a photography professor and they kind of came together as like word and image so it naturally kind of led to filmmaking huh. i'd write the script and i'll go do the photography the, the you know the filmmaking the videography and uh yeah then i moved right to los angeles worked in venice beach for a company called digital domain <laughs> they do you know high-end visual effects for avengers and it was started by james cameron so it was really cool wow. that i had architecture background. I knew 3D modeling oh, wow. and I knew CAD. So my skills translated to this like new emerging world of visual effects um, where they were hiring people from the architecture background because they knew 3D and they knew camera tracking. <laughs> so I just kind of, I soaked it up. I soaked it up and I just learned so much. Uh, I, I had great experiences working with people like Ron Howard and Jim Carrey, you know, I was just a PA. It's not like I was collaborating with them, but I would be bringing things to set, watching them work while I'm, you know, taking care of my little duties on set. You mm -hmm. know, I was kind of shuttling people around, you know, going to get the actors, going to tell the director they need them on set. So just that, but I'm, I was able to observe and I was able to sit there for 12 hours, 14 hours a day and watch the directors and actors collaborate and wow. talk like right in front of me, you know, so <laughs> watching Ron Howard, you know, direct, it was like an awesome treat for me. I had never taken too many film classes. I think by the end, I actually qualified for a visual arts minor from UC Berkeley because I took a lot of photography classes. Huh. Uh, but the the chance to to do that really showed me how a director sets up a shot, frames a scene, and then communicates it to a hundred people, so that everyone is on the same page. That has always blown my mind. Um, I mean, obviously, in the practice of architecture, it's a collaborative effort, but it doesn't seem to be as fast paced. It doesn't seem to be as that urgency of I would imagine when you're on set and you are a director or whatever position, there there are a lot of people looking to you like in that that moment right then make a decision because maybe something's not working or you want a different uh different take on something um i i, I is that i mean I, I feel like it'd be very stressful it is stressful directing in the hollywood world is is very stressful there's a lot of pressure because the movies have such big budgets there's huge mm -hmm. high expectations what i um what I noticed in filmmaking is it's the last art form where there's like a true artist at the top <laughs> and everyone else kind of works below them. There's teams and stuff. But in architecture, you can have three or four principals working on it, a couple project managers, maybe a designer, an engineer. There's much more team approach. And it used to be like Frank Lloyd Wright was the master. You know, he would do it. And then his team of assistants would execute the work. Filmmaking is still like that, where the director is the lead artist and they have all the, the power and all the control. It hasn't <laughs> gone into this like, six or seven equal people at the top working on it 
right quite like other uh, other industries so yeah there there's a lot of a stress that comes with that and you have to communicate you have to be a great communicator because you have a hundred different people that have all different needs from what makeup do i put them in what color shirt do you want do we want the lighting to be moody do we want atmosphere like fog in here and you have to be able to clearly articulate what you need and at what level you know i want a red shirt but i don't want like so red because it's gonna be too bright mm-hmm. give me a level five you know give me a level three maybe a maroon so that's that's a big part of directing Interesting. But so for you, you're there, you're witnessing, you're observing, you're seeing people like Ron Howard and Jim Carrey, which is wild. Um, but so it was, <laughs> that, that's the movie. It was the Grinch who stole Christmas. So oh, it was out, it? <laughs> yeah, it came out 20 years ago. You know, that's right when I graduated and they filmed it on a big blue screen in, in Venice Beach at Digital Domain, the company I was working at. So that, that was a project. That is such that's a. Wild. <laughs> that's a weird movie project. too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but so, but uh, during that entire time, filmmaking was 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 that clearly to you the the passion, the the direction you were going to head, or were you, you know, more open to other avenues within the filmmaking uh, world? I wasn't. I, I I had put architecture in the rearview mirror. I said I I love design, and my whole life I wanted to be an architect. Legos, Lincoln Logs. I love the idea of designing my own home, but filmmaking just hit me because I was out of a desk, away from a computer, in this kind of physical world with other artists, and that was so energizing. Mm-hmm. And not a lot of art forms are like that anymore. A lot of them are being produced, you know, you're produced behind a computer. Yeah. Even movies uh, do, but to have 20 people out on a location in the desert, you know, f- trying to capture a car, you know, driving off a cliff or flying to, you know, I don't know, the Pacific Northwest to get some shots in a forest of an actor kind of coming, coming out of a forest. That was just a lot more exciting than having an office job to me. So I, I put architecture in, in the rear view mirror. I had done graphic design kind of as a freelance thing to make money. And I kept doing that. So I kept graphic design going. I kept photography going as a hobby. Uh, but I was all in on filmmaking. My mind was open to it. I was starting, I'm really starting my second major for my first five years out of college, I was like taking on and learning another degree, but in a hands-on way. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of, you know, the actual skill of, of like holding a camera and being the one behind the camera, were you learning those things like on the job as well? Or did you have to take, I don't know, supplemental classes to kind of boost that skill set? Well, one thing you'll know, David, is there's like, I don't know, there's almost like six to 7,000 films made every year. And most of those are independent films made by small people who want to break into the industry. Mm. So there's tons of opportunity to work on these little independent films. So Mm -hmm. my actual technical learning was doing my own little films, short things on, you know, people that I knew, artists, uh, documentaries, uh, other filmmakers I worked with at Digital Domain who want to shoot something on the weekend, someone would edit it. So my technical experience with camera movement, editing, and production kind of came from Five years of independent filmmaking. I probably worked on probably 25 short films in that time. And then my my kind of professional side was at work watching the directors and actors work together. So both were happening at the, at the same time. Is the uh, the independent film kind of seen as grueling and difficult as as I imagine it to be? I, I feel like there's a there's a ton of people doing it. It probably yeah. means long hours and the you know, you don't necessarily know when you embark on a project, I'm going to assume, if, if it's going to turn out well or not, you know? It is. It could be. A lot of first-time filmmakers jump in and just say, I have an idea for a feature script. Um, you know, it's about me. I grew up in this house in Pennsylvania, and this happened. And a lot of filmmakers in L.A. will use their stories to come up with something. Mm-hmm. But since they don't have the technical knowledge or they never produced something before, they don't quite know the, the, the scale of job that they're in for. So it could become very grueling if it's their first one. Reshoots, you know, having problems with audio is a constant issue with independent filmmaking. Mm-hmm. You can't afford good audio, so now you're re-recording things. And you generally shoot sun up to sun down if you want to catch, capture all that natural light. You want to capture that beautiful dawn with that golden light in the morning, that blue light and then gold. And then you want to capture that golden light in the afternoon. So, yeah, I mean, in the summer, you could be working 14, 15 hours if you're outside doing an, an indie film. 
It's a long day. <laughs> it's a long day. It's so stressful. I, I think. I think the. Well, but coming from architecture, I feel like it's like the charrette, right? <laughs> it is. It is. But it's. It's the thing that that strikes me as being different. You know, uh, like one thing we realized doing the podcast and being in front of cameras a very little bit is that, you know, when you're working on an architecture project, it's. Um, it's uh, what is it? It's almost like it's all post post production in the sense like there's a thing you're working on always continually and it's there on the desk right. or on the computer. But like in filming or in audio, there's a take, right? And and you can do a lot in post, but you're dependent on what happens in that moment, in that minute, to capture the lighting just right or the time of the day or not to have traffic go by or whatever else there is. And that's the part that um, I would imagine makes it exciting, but also. Uh, it makes it makes me sweat <laughs> thinking about it, you know. <laughs> it's true. You you may only have you know ten days of production, and you got to capture these scenes, and uh, you have to get them right. If yeah, if some audio problem happens, you have to redo it right then and there. You don't try to fix it later in post production. That's just way too much work, and it's never real. So uh, yeah, that that production can be stressful. It's. Um, you have to capture it properly when you're there on set, or you have to edit around it later on if something catastrophic happens. If you can't get the green screen to work or something, you know, you have to try and work that out later. But yeah, that that the physical production makes it exciting, and that is where the where the pressure is at of getting it done properly. Mm. So you were working at uh, what was the name name of the company again? Digital uh, Di Digital Domain. Digital Domain for was it five ten years? Uh, I worked at Digital Domain for about three years okay. in the camera tracking department, and then I worked in general production in LA. So I would work with Animal Planet, I'd work with different networks, you know, uh, Discovery Channel, FX. A lot of film shoots, surprisingly, are, are, are pretty brief. The way that the film industry works is it's an industry of freelancers. Huh. No one works for Paramount full time, no one works for mm -hmm. Warner Brothers full time. Really? So, you know, in one year, you can work on 20 different jobs. Uh, a music video takes three days, so that's it. You know, you shoot, um, shoot a music video, that's three days. A commercial could be two days. A TV show, you know, one-hour TV show is usually shot in seven days. A feature mm -hmm. film can be two months. So you hop around between different projects working at different scales constantly in, in, in the industry. So in one week, you could do two totally different commercials. Um, so I did that for about two years, and that taught me a little bit more about editing and camera work. Uh, that was like seeing how people would edit things together. I worked for a studio called Stu Siegel Studios, and they produced uh, Veronica Mars. Okay. And uh, yeah, Invisible Man, a bunch of kind of B level science fiction stuff for the Sci Fi Channel, for, w, for Warner Brothers Channel. And I had the opportunity to work for an inserts crew. So, an inserts crew is about four or five little scruffy, long haired guys. <laughs> with, you, with beards and they have a camera and they have like a few uh stunt doubles and body doubles and then you have the main crew the a crew which is about 100 people and they have tom cruise and brad pitt and the big directors so what will happen is the a camera will film tom cruise looking at a computer trying to save the world right something's happening there's a bomb that's going to detonate in paris <laughs> so he's on the computer and he's looking frantic they get all the close-up shots then, because he's such a high-valued actor, they move on to the next shots with his face, and they bring in the body double to get the shots of the hands on the keyboard, to get shots of the oh, screen. Those are all done without the main actor. <laughs> yeah. Those not his not hands? Gonna... What? <laughs> <laughs> Those hands aren't real. <laughs> Those hands aren't real. So I worked on this insert crew, and that really taught me about the, the structure of editing and how you can shoot things totally separate, but putting them right next to each other mm. right. and they flow and no one will even know. So we did that for years and I, you know, two, two, three years. And I learned, you know, we, they would shoot a, a scene three months ago and they would send us a note. We need an establishing shot of the outside of this office. We need a body double driving his car up to the parking lot. We need this. So we would all shoot that three months after the main actor did with all the doubles and then they would stitch it together in editing. So it's called inserts. You insert it into a scene and it doesn't have anything that is um, like identifiable to it. So you can't tell that it was shot differently, separately by a whole different crew. Hmm. And that just really showed me, 
about editing and how films can be made it kind of almost it's almost like a quilt you knit together right. and you can knit together all these different pieces and the audio can happen separately and and that was uh, that was just a really good experience you know we that's where we got the name bread truck films we actually had an old <laughs> wonder bread truck that they gave us the studio gave us this old truck it had a dark room it had an editing bay it had a camera rack and lights and and we had our shot lists and we were tasked with driving all around california getting these little shots that make an entire scene that didn't have the main actor's face wow, wow that's incredible so uh was it an actual wonder bread truck it was a real Wonder Bread <laughs> truck, Dave. This thing at one point in one day was serving Wonder Bread trucks, driving it to grocery stores, <laughs> dropping it off in Los Angeles. Here's your hot dog buns. Here's your weenie buns. Here's, you know, your sandwiches. And the studio got a hold of it and turned it into like this mobile film studio. <laughs> it fit four guys. It was perfect. And we drove all around California in this Wonder Bread truck. And it just taught me like, you can make films really fast and quick with this like small efficient crew mm -hmm. if you shoot a little differently than the than the big guys with the actors and the close-ups and the hair and makeup and the wardrobe so it just it stuck to me that this was like a really efficient quick way to be creative without having to have a giant crew and a giant budget mm -hmm. so when you drove around in that truck uh, around california did you know where like did you have a map or and a schedule of where you were supposed to go and stop and what you were supposed to capture what was we, it? Yeah. Yeah, we did. Like they would send us a rough cut. So they would have a rough cut and it's like, okay, here's Tom Cruise is inside, you know, um, uh, let's say he's inside like some police headquarters or something. And they would have a black screen with white text on it that says, shoot wide establishing shot of LAPD headquarters. <laughs> <laughs> so we would see the rough cut and see that note and know, okay, we need to shoot a wide establishing shot of LAPD headquarters because that's filling in for the MI6, you know, office. So right. yeah, we, we would have a plan and we would know exactly what we had to shoot that day. It would be pretty organized. Films are pretty organized because they're so expensive. Yeah. Right. That, uh, it's documentaries that are a lot looser. A lot right. of documentaries is a whole different form. You can show up without a plan, without a script, and you kind of wait for moments to reveal themselves to you. And that's, kind of what I do with architecture films. I do write a script and I know, I know what I want them to say because I know the audience wants to know about, you know, where is this building? What does it do? You know, why is it, you know, three little boxes instead of one big rectangle? Right. So I, I get that across, but then I, I leave space for things to develop. Like maybe the architect is going to be building a model and I didn't plan that and there he is and I and I get a quick shot of that or I get him together talking to someone about the material board and I kind of kind of capture that kind of without a plan impromptu so my films are a hybrid of both Hollywood films don't have any improv in, in, in improvisation it's all really planned and documentaries are, are somewhat planned and somewhat improvised hmm. trying to capture you know human behavior Yes, and we definitely want to hear more about uh, your your specific process. Um, but talking about your experience uh, in the in the Wonder Bread van uh, was <laughs> the the uh, the the most um, the thing you learned most from that experience was. Do you think it's, it's the ability to be kind of like light footed and be with a small crew? Yeah, I think you hit it. I think you hit it on the head. I think it was. I worked with the 100 person crew my first season on Veronica Mars. I was the PA. Mm -hmm. And like when you need to go from one location in Los Angeles to another, it could take two hours to move 100 people yeah. Oh, yeah. and have them set up. So they would really try to schedule their days and shoots around one location. And I was a filmmaker and with an architecture background, instantly I want to shoot a bunch of locations. I want this guy at the beach where it's blue hour and I want him downtown LA where it's hot and, and orange, you know, this, as an architect, you're attracted to different locations to tell the story. And I saw how hard it is for a big Hollywood crew to move to different locations, but mm -hmm. how easy it was for us, the insert crew to move. Huh. So I think that really impressed on me that like, environments are a really big part of my filmmaking because I want to see that skyline. I want to see that neighborhood. I want to see, you know, nature and I want to see urbanism because of my architecture background. It's a real big part of it. And to be mobile with a truck and to have a small crew, you can really drive around and get those different locations in one day. Yeah. Yeah. 
And what's interesting is that so you, you you were doing that for a period of time and then you actually transitioned, I guess, in a way back to doing architecture. What? <laughs> they pulled me back in, David. It's like the Godfather. I'm trying to get out. They pulled me. They pulled me back in. They pulled me back in. Yeah, I, I uh, had moved to San Diego to do some television work with a couple friends I knew down here, and we, we worked on uh, some more of those shows for Sci Fi Network. Invisible Man was was a big one that was happening down here. Then the studio kind of had a had a, a labor dispute where people were on strike. You know, you'll see that in Hollywood sometimes. So people were on strike and I didn't have any work for a while. And just coincidentally, serendipitously, someone I was working with had a roommate who was working at an architecture firm. And they came to my house one day and they saw all my renderings from college. I had animations. I was doing graphic design, you know, kind of kind of as a, as a hobby. And I had them posted up on my wall and they said, wow, we can really use you at our architecture firm to do rebranding, to help us get, you know, 3D Studio Max up and going so we can get some good renderings. Uh, and I didn't have any film work at the time, so I said, yeah, you know, sure, let's do it. And that led to about a year where I would be working in design a few days a week and then work picking up commercial work or t television work or documentary work, um, you know, one or two days a week. So for a short period, I truly had architecture and filmmaking happening almost each week. Hmm. Interlocked. See my hands there. Yeah. <laughs> Interlocked. Uh, uh, where, where I would almost have to switch my brain because you're in a totally different industry. Uh, the film industry moves quick. You have to have things on set. You have to be ready to get the shot. Architecture moves very slow. There's going to be meetings. There's going to be reviews. There's going to be red lines. It's going to be you know a year of design, two and a half years of construction. So uh, I had to really learn how to like adapt to the different needs of these different mm -hmm. industries back and forth each week. So the pace of things is something that's, that uh, appeared to you as being clearly different between these two uh, professions. Um, and I guess, I mean, I could, I could kind of see that because we take our, I mean, buildings take a long time to build, but we also take our sweet time in comparison <laughs> to some of these other projects, I feel. You know, we sit and we talk and we sketch and, <laughs> and like you said, there's meetings, we talk again and, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I don't know, maybe there isn't the luxury of that much time with a lot of film projects. I think architecture is just a lot, it's just people don't realize it, but it's a pretty regulated profession. So mm. when you're designing, you know, a front of a building, you may have a design pretty quick, but then you're spending a lot of time figuring out how the, how the ha handicap access ramp works, mm. how the fire sprinklers plug in, how the parking works. So in filmmaking, it's not regulated. If you have an idea, you know, all right, I want this guy to kick down the door and blast everyone with his AK-47, <laughs> you can set that up and go do that. Right. In architecture, you come up with an idea, you have to spend, you know, a long time getting it up to code, following the building permit process, getting it approved, making sure it works with these different people. So I think it's, it's just, you know, one's in the physical world and it's meant to last and one's just a 2D uh, right. piece of entertainment, which is much more of a graphic art piece. So I, I think those are real inherent differences and that changes the process to make it much longer for architecture. For sure, for sure. Uh, I'm curious, what were some of the other things you saw, you know, when you were going back and forth during the week? Uh, what were some of the things you saw as being, you know, more challenging with the filmmaking process and, and more challenging for the architecture? Well, I always found when I got into practice, like when you go to architecture school, you're designing all these cool things. You're designing libraries, you're designing, you know, civic centers, you're designing like new mixed use buildings. Like at Berkeley, they would find an empty parking lot downtown Berkeley and we would be tasked with designing a new building for education. Mm -hmm. When you get into architecture in the real world, after you've graduated, you're not licensed. You're not designing things that are at that creative level. You're usually doing, you know, CAD detailing, rivet stuff, window specs, you're supporting architecture uh, in a more technical way. They don't give you a museum that's design right out of school. Mm -hmm. But in filmmaking, you can get pretty creative pretty fast. If you team up with an actor and a director of photography, you know, you can put together a little storyline where you're in the lead and you're controlling the creativity mm -hmm. at a young age. So architecture is a gray hair profession, they say, you know. People like Frank Gehry and, you know, um, different architects, Tom Main, 
you know, they spent 40 years building a reputation to get to be able to do the work they want to do. But someone like Quentin Tarantino or Robert Rodriguez, even George Lucas and Spielberg, they were doing, I would say, well, an architect can do when they're 60, they were doing when they were 25, maybe uh -huh. 30, maybe 35. So I think that actually drew me more to filmmaking. You can be more creative a lot younger. Mm -hmm. And there, it's more of an art form where building, especially in California, is, uh, you know, it's like a commerce, it's a product that needs to be sold, it needs to be marketed, it needs to be regulated and how it's built. Mm -hmm. You have to have a team of people together, you have to have building permits, you have to have neighborhood feedback. And filmmaking doesn't have any of that. You can do it, you can do it when you're young. Yeah. Uh, I, especially maybe now that's even more the case because the way technology has evolved. Um, you know, yeah, uh, it's 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 much easier to shoot a, a pretty high quality uh, production, um, and you have the access to equipment to do it. Yeah, yeah, cameras are cheap. A high quality four K camera is easy to get a hold of. Uh, Adobe Premiere is easy to get a hold of. You can market it, you know, through Vimeo, through YouTube, through film festivals. There's different outlets, but for a twenty five year old person to build like a custom home that's overlooking Los Angeles in the hills, that's yeah. unrealistic. Yeah, that'll right. never happen. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, because you need a client. <laughs> 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 I guess if you're a filmmaker, your client is potentially the audience, you know, if, if you're kind of doing it in an independent film. They're the ones who end up paying for it. The studios put up the money first. Right, right. Or you get investors. Fundraising is a big part of independent filmmaking. Hmm. So you get investors, you get your parents, you get other filmmakers. <laughs> Uh, you know, you, you scrabble together money. I mean, you can, you know, films that have been successful that have been made for $10,000, $50,000. Um, most independent films that you'll see in a theater are around $200,000. That's kind of the SAG minimum to get like a SAG is the actors union. And mm -hmm. that's where you can get like high quality unionized actors. So, I mean, yeah, you can do it younger if you can get cash together. People do it all the time. There's thousands of indie films made every year. You see them all over Netflix and Amazon. You never heard of them, never heard of the people in them, but they could be decent. And, and is like the 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 chances of success for one, I, you know, because for a lot of these independent filmmakers, they 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 want to go the whole nine yards. They want they want success. And what prevents them from getting there is obviously the quality of of the piece itself, but. I assume it's just a combination of luck and networking and that kind of stuff as well, because there's so many. There's a lot into it. A lot of filmmaking is tied to marketing. Yeah. So if you create this awesome film, but don't have a budget to let people know that it's there, you'll fail. Hmm. Uh, you know, marketing is a huge part of filmmaking. And even in Hollywood, they will match if the Avengers cost $200, 000, $200 million to produce, they will have a $200 million marketing budget. Whoa, so a lot really? of it's marketing. Yeah. Just because like, we don't need films, you know, it's mm. not like, uh, you not like, a you know, a toaster <laughs> or, uh, you know, a couch, which you're going to actively seek out, you know, we're looking for entertainment on a Friday night. We want to see a film we've heard of before. Uh, that's mm -hmm. usually what, what guides our choices, you know? Um, so you have to get a quite a bit of marketing out to be a successful independent filmmaker. And maybe that's getting in a festival like Sundance. Maybe that's getting in a big festival like Tribeca where they help market your film. Um, but that's a big part of like getting your reputation out there as a filmmaker and as a director is you have to market it. You have to do these festivals. You have to try and get distribution. And that is a big business side to, to getting it out there. Once the film's done, making the film's easy, actually, hmm. to be honest, that's fun. Yeah, Everyone right. wants to do that, but then you need to spend typically about a year, maybe a year and a half on the road with festivals, promoting it, shaking hands, meeting audiences, getting mm -hmm. it in theaters so people get out. So that's a really big side of filmmaking. I mean, I guess during that time too, you're not necessarily also producing the next thing during that. You're, you're, you're having to allocate a, a good amount of time to the marketing effort. You do. Yeah, you do. You know, they say in Hollywood, they say you're not hiring an actor to act in the film. You're hiring them to promote the film afterwards. <laughs> so when you see Brad Pitt on Ellen DeGeneres promoting his latest movie, yeah, yeah. he did the movie. It took him six months, but he's going to spend the next year and a half going around the world doing interview after interview to, to, to promote it. So promotion and marketing are a big part of the film ecosystem. I mean, that's a little bit different 
uh, you know, to architecture, I suppose. But that's got to be, on the one hand, a bit frustrating for folks who, you know, they just love the craft of making films and they don't want to be bothered with because it's a kind of a different hat to wear in a way right yeah tell me about it david my first... <laughs> <How's> <laughs> you're looking at you're looking at someone my first i made two feature films both on street artists one was with shepherd fairy one oh. was with mike giant and mike maxwell and oh. i made these i just love filmmaking so i jumped in i didn't know about marketing i didn't know about planning i made this film i had it done i was like great it's done i'll put it on youtube and then i'm getting like you know whatever 25 views hmm. you know uh 100 views and as i'm starting to talk to other people around me i start to learn that marketing has to be the process or people don't see these films so yeah, it sucks because you have to become a businessman and now you're setting up you know, screenings and you're coordinating things. It has none to do with cinematography or editing. It's all promotion and that's like a different hat yeah. uh, totally. So you know, a lot of filmmakers give up after a few future films because they just don't want to spend all the time marketing it and, and uh, you know, they go into commercials or they go into branded content or working for agencies where that's taken care of already and they can just focus on the creativity. Yeah. I, I think it's, uh, for the general uh, consumer, the audience, it's pretty easy to forget or to not even realize that the amount of like blunt force effort it takes to market. Like if you're the average person, you've heard about this film, I've seen a commercial for, for, for wherever, the amount of work it took for you to hear about that thing, you know, is, is massive. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like we don't think about that, you know? And that's something that we've realized more with what we do. It's like... You know, if we manage to have someone hear about what we do, it's like that person that doesn't realize how much work it took just to get them to hear about it, right. forgetting, forgetting the doing of the thing itself. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, man. You, yeah, that is a difference. That is a difference for sure. I was wondering, you know, you were talking about the, the freedom of like the four person crew versus like a hundred person crew. Um, and and obviously with a hundred person crew, there are certain things that, that 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 you can accomplish that a four person group can't. But like, what are those differences? Is it just I don't know, like quality of things, the, the flexibility to to have like what's the difference between a crew of that size? Because it feels like you have access to really good technology now that you know lesser and lesser people can can use to do something great. So what's that gap between? you know, a 96 person gap. The gap, I think really is it comes down to CYA, cover your ass. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and then what I mean by that is when you have a big crew, you have these monitors, it's called Video Village. You have these big flat screen monitors and they're shaded from the sun. And you have about 15 people sitting around looking at the monitor. And you have the hairstylist looking, making sure the hair is, and you're making perfect. You're making sure things are technically polished every shot hmm. time and time again so you have a hair person looking at the hair you have the wardrobe guy looking at how the shirt or the jacket's reacting you have the props guy making sure does he have the right gun is it held in the right way you have a script supervisor making sure are they saying the right thing is the cigarette in the left hand or the right hand is the glass is the glass of whiskey half empty or is it a quarter empty hmm. you have the director telling them how to emote so that big crew looks at these monitors and makes sure every scene is technically polished and perfect. And when you have a four person crew, you can't do that. You mm -hmm. don't have that. You just kind of look through the viewfinder. You watch the actor, you know, in documentaries, what I do, I don't need technical perfection. I'm here to film an architect to tell their story about why this building is like transforming a neighborhood. I don't care if they're wearing a white shirt against the white background. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I think, you know, for, for, for big crews, big Hollywood crews, they have a lot of people to make everything perfect. If something is funky, you'll spot it right away. It's called a false note. So mm -hmm. if, you know, Jennifer Aniston is like talking and her hat's like slipping down, covering this corner of her eye, then you're distracted and the audience is taken out of the story because something weird happened. When you have a hundred people, you sit there and make sure nothing weird is happening everything's happening perfectly and they're saying the perfect thing getting dialogue right is, is actually quite a big deal to get the, the lines right that that's huh. a big part of it too wow it's amazing it's amazing so yeah uh so i don't they... play that game i don't play that game Dave. <laughs> I, I roll up with these architects we get it man i make it beautiful i make it natural 
Um, but I keep it moving. I keep it moving yeah. quickly and I keep a focus on a story about architecture, design, neighborhood and people. So I, I want to get to that. So how, how, what was the transition from doing the, uh, the insert, uh, footage, and then you were kind of working a few days of the week in, in architecture offices to eventually doing what you do now, which is you said is like, um, I don't know how you would describe it, maybe like documentary style films it's that that uh, feature discussions about design and architecture, something along those lines. Yeah, I call them design films. Okay. It's just a general category. You know, uh, I, I do use the word film instead of video because I try to write a script with a story. I try to have a beginning, middle, and end. Hmm. I really use cinematography to c convey emotion and, and expression. So I call them films because they have like a higher level of craftsmanship than just a video. Uh, but yeah, design film. So here I am. I'm working in architecture. I'm in San Diego. I'm moving away on renderings. I'm pumping away on rebranding the firm, um, designing things. You know, I, I worked myself into a pretty good position where a new project would come in the door. And since I knew uh, Three Studio Max really well, I would do all the initial kind of modeling, mass modeling, laying out the site, initial aesthetics. So I kind of set the project up at the very beginning, what it looks like, what it feels like, and how it roughly works. I'd pump out tons of renderings and boards. I'd help with the presentations. Then once the project kind of got approved and moved forward, it would leave my desk and go on to someone in, in design development, someone who's in Rivet or CAD to like really start to figure out the nuts and bolts of it. So I worked myself into this like kind of creative art director position as a young person not having to do CAD in a firm, which is pretty rare. Uh, and I did that by doing renderings, doing animations, doing graphic design, and I did photography. So I would go photograph the projects when they were done. So I kind of worked myself into this like creative director position. So I'm pumping away, pumping out all types of stuff. I love it. 2008 comes, mm -hmm. the recession happens. My firm goes from 50 people to five people in about eight months. Ugh. So I got laid off. I got a kick in the pants and, uh, my boss said, man, Jeff, you do not want to be in architecture. You have a chance to get into a different industry right now. Everyone has a screen in their pocket. Everyone has a website, film and video, high quality stuff is easy to watch now. You should really pursue that. So that was Graham Downs, my boss in San Diego at the time. Hmm. So he would bring me back to do video and film work for him and different architects around town. Um, and I always liked it. It was a hobby, but now doing it with architects and getting paid for it was a new development. This was new. I had done Hollywood. I had done documentaries with different, um, different people, but I had never really like sat down and filmed architecture and tried to tell its story um, intentionally. Hmm. It kind of popped up because of my positions in the firm. They knew I was a film guy, so they'd send me make a little video. But here I was getting hired and getting paid to do promotional work. And I would bring my documentary background and what I learned in Hollywood to make it unique and different. And, you know, he said something, I love this. He said, at the end of a film, audiences stand up and clap. At the end of an arc, at the end of an architecture project, usually the clients piss and they sue you or the contractor is upset and they walk off the job or the building has come out so different than the way you designed it. You don't even want to photograph. <laughs> and your well, job told is to me. fix all of this with a nice video <laughs> yeah and this guy had pretty good work he had good clean modern work he was a south african designer and he had like you know really good contemporary work so i was like yeah you know all right that makes sense so <laughs> you know uh i'm laid off anyway i loved film and video anyway i had been doing it as a hobby i had had my experience in, in, in big productions so now let me try my hand at doing these mini documentaries with architects that are more focused on design and uh you know it was different than the bread truck film days where i was like driving a bread truck around but it was similar. It was where I just had a small crew and we just kind of drove around the city filming different projects from architects. I knew how to interview them because I knew the language, you know, I know how to talk about a building envelope or talk about, you know, why do you have these big north facing windows here? Talk to me about natural light. How does the building change over the seasons, you know, as the landscape changes? So I knew all that and I was able to kind of help them get promotional videos out, uh, out, of, out of them uh, for their websites, for awards for different competitions they were entering. 
and this was about 10 years ago. So video was a, a really new thing for, mm -hmm. for people to have access to. And here's this guy that knew architecture and was making films. And that just became a word of mouth thing. And it spread all around San Diego with different developers, different architects, organizations, nonprofits. I became known as like a guy who does architectural filmmaking. So I never planned on it. When I went to UC Berkeley, if you said, you're going to be making films about architects and that's going to be your, your like main thing. I'd be like, what is that? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> I know what architectural photography is. Everyone knows that. Right. Um, so it kind of organically happened and I actually resisted it at first, David, to be honest, I actually resisted it and tried to get back in Hollywood and try to get back on set. And huh. I did, I did for a while. I got back into commercials and documentaries. I got to do really cool things with athletes and kind of more, um, kind of branding corporate content. Uh, -huh. uh so I got to do stuff with like Nike and Adidas and we'd follow these runners as they would uh, compete in these races around the United States and kind of do their story of, of what they're going through. And there's an agency involved. And sometimes it was a regular person that was to try and do it. Sometimes it was a known athlete, a lot of stuff in running. So I, I kept that going with the architecture thing parallel for almost like five, six, seven years, hmm. not thinking that architecture could ever be like a full-time deal. Um, but then the last two or three years, I've really been able to roll with just designers, developers, people who develop products for architecture, schools, academia, like, like Woodbury, people like the AIA, people like um, different foundations who need to get a message out about a building project they're trying to get off the ground or a museum they need funding for. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've really started to focus the last few years just on the design world. Right, right, right. I mean, I think it makes sense. You know, I, I think the architectural photography, as you said, has been around for obviously a very long time and was certainly a decade ago was much more well known than uh, than video production or filmmaking around architecture. But seeing how everything is moving, uh, I would imagine it's going to become even more uh, integral to the architecture kind of marketplace. Yeah, you know, architects, I've noticed my time out of architecture, I've had actually a lot of reflection on who architects are. I've interviewed probably over five, 600 architects so far. Wow. So they're definitely futurists that look to the future. So video being like the latest way to communicate, I say this is just the beginning of the age of video hmm. right now. It's going to start now, and when my kids are older, it's going to be like, show me some old photos, show me the video. Right. So I think architects are futurists, and they look – they look towards this as being new technology. They also, there's like a big connection between motion and architecture. You know, architects have always wanted to express motion, whether it's a big glass pivot door on the front of a house that kind of spins open in a way, or the way the light tracks ac across a wall inside over the, you know, eight hours during the day. I think architects have always been fascinated with phenomena mm -hmm. and motion, motion of how a body walks through a space, motion of how weather and atmosphere kind of, uh, you know, affect the building, like fog in San Francisco for views. Um, so I think there's like a natural um, curiosity mm. about, yeah, l let me show how this building lives. And then you bring in the storytelling because now you're interviewing people. So there's a human element. There's like an emotional element that a photograph can never have because you can interview a homeless person who used to be used to talk about, you know, taking a bath in a McDonald's sink now they're living in this new bricks and scarpa designed affordable housing project in macarthur park mm -hmm. now they have a bed and they have a space so you have this kind of human component that you don't get in photography and then you have the emotional component with music and you think about music and sound and how that makes you feel you hear the raindrops falling on the glass you know you you hear the foghorn in the distance as you open up on a wide shot of san francisco um so all those things like I think uh, are more effective and they're also like kind of a futuristic way of telling a story. Hmm. So then regarding your process, uh, you mentioned that you do storyboarding, uh, but specifically um, how detailed do you get beforehand for, for kind of a typical film that you do these days? Is it, are you sketching things? That's a good question. It, it usually, like I usually break it down when an architect reaches out, I say, you know, just like design, it starts with the conversation. So let's talk, you know, what are your goals? Who's the audience? I want to know who the audience for, right? Mm -hmm. Is this a sales video for high-end 
you know, empty nesters that want to buy a luxury unit in Seattle? Is this a film for young architecture students that are looking to get licensed? And we need to talk about how this program helps them. So you want to find the audience, who you're talking to, what the goal of the film is. Um, you know, sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes they have like a beautiful house in Tahoe and you know, you're going to do a story about the environment of Tahoe, the nature and how the house fits in. Um, but sometimes it's like a little more nuanced, especially with urban films. Like you may want voices from different areas. You may want a voice of someone who lives there. You may want a voice of a nonprofit. You may want the voice of the architect. You may want the voice of a mayor. So you kind of start by talking to them and you kind of define like who you want talking in the film. Hmm. They're always three to five minutes. That part's pretty consistent. Uh, they never usually go that long. Um, you just don't have an attention span mm-hmm. online. So you kind of define that and you define a little bit about the message, what you want the audience to walk away with. You know, do you want them to f- feel like, you know, Miller Hall is a, a, a cutting edge, sustainable firm where they walk the walk and, and everything they do is sustainable and green and about energy or is it someone that's more like, I just did a f- film with um, Alice Kim and John Friedman. <laughs> um, is it more about like form making and, and, you know, rigorous playfulness and color? Um, so you kind of get a few keywords that the architect mentions and you use those to build a script on. Right. And then when you go to shoot a building, uh, you scout the, the place beforehand, right? To kind of scope out and see, you know, what shots you're going to pull uh, do and things like this. Yeah, you try to. You try to. If it's a Southern California project, I I can drive and take a look at it. Sometimes it's a three-day shoot, like in New York or Seattle or somewhere, and the first day is kind of a meet the architect, scout, take a couple scouting shots, then you film the next two days. So a lot of times you have these travel trips where the whole process kind of happens within like a three-day window. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sometimes in California and Los Angeles and Bay Area, the process can happen a little longer because you can go back. Right. And you can go ahead of time and meet people. Um, but usually like a nice three minute video, multi-layered video where you have people from the community talking, the architects talking, talking and the organizations talking, usually that's a three day shoot. Yeah. Has there ever been, um, you know, like you were saying that you, you leave a certain amount of, uh, improvisation is, ex- is expected for, for this style of, of, uh, of film, right? Um, like how much, I mean, I guess it varies from projects, but how much, uh, openness is there to that uh, when you're, when you're, uh, actually doing the shooting? That's a good question. That's a good question. So the, the way documentary filmmaking works, David, this will be like pretty exciting for your audience is it's usually an eight to one ratio. So for one shot you see on the screen, there's eight shots that didn't make it. So if you have a three minute video, you're shooting usually like three hours Mm -hmm. of raw footage and you know, some of it's big interviews where people are talking for a long time. So within all that footage, you're the camera's picking things up, you know, sometimes you don't even have to, you know, look for an improvisational moment. It happens. Sometimes you got a beautiful shot framed up and then a cat starts running up the stairs (laughs) and you know, you're rolling and you caught that cat. Sometimes you're filming the architect talking and they, you know, I don't know, they pull out a tape measure and do something really expressive, you know, Um, or they put on like a hat in an interesting way. So a lot of things are kind of just captured unintentionally along those three days. Um, Sometimes, you know, sometimes you try to build it out a little bit, like um, maybe the architect was inspired by, you know, the banks of the Missouri River. So they're building something in downtown Omaha. So you film that, but you're like, hey, let's drive an hour north to the banks of the river where you can see how the river kind of splits off another river and let's film you down there. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you'll do different locations to set things up and a lot of things you you just capture naturally along the way. Then editing. Editing is the most important part. So Mm -hmm. editing is where you want to put in the surprises. The most important thing for a, a film, for an audience is to surprise them. And, you know, architecture films don't have to be surprising. You can have a talking head describe the building, why they use concrete, why they, you know, have it located there. You can make it pretty informational, but it's those surprises, like a cat jumps in the frame 
or you're doing a drone shot and someone rides through on a skateboard in a yellow jacket. You didn't expect that. Finding those and editing and mixing those in so the audience is constantly like seeing something that they didn't expect in frame mm-hmm. is usually what you what you uh, what you pick out in editing quite a bit and you try to put in those moments. Huh. Is it hard to estimate like how much time projects are going to take to shoot and to edit? Oh. Yeah, you know, uh, Marina, I've, after 10 years and like maybe three to 400 films, I've got a, a pretty, pretty dependable process. If I shoot a building for three days, I know I'll have it. Right. Mm-hmm. I'll have everything I need. I'll have interviews. I'll have footage. I'll have it at sunset. I'll have it during the daytime. I'll have the landscape. I'll have the interiors and I'll have details. So I estimate that. Then I typically take about a week to edit. I like to move fast. I like to get in right after a shoot, come home, bust out all these three hours of raw footage, come up with a rough cut pretty fast with music, titles, text. Then I spend about a week kind of massaging it. Then I share it with the client to get feedback from them. And we kind of massage it out for another two weeks. So that's pretty quick. Yeah, it is. <laughs> that's pretty damn it quick. <laughs> it is. It's pretty damn quick. You know, the secret <laughs> is. And here's my secret. You know, that's not by accident. That's by design. It's because I write the script, I shoot the film, I direct the film, and I edit it. It's because right. it goes through one single person yeah. that yeah. you're able to make things way more efficient than if you hired a three, four, five person production company. Right. Mm-hmm. Typically, you have a director, he deals with the clients. You have a producer, they deal with the schedule. Okay, where are we going? We're flying to North Carolina. How long? Let me book hotels. Let me figure out the day. We need to start at, you know, at 6 a.m. at this lake, and then we need to end here. Then you usually have like a cameraman, two cameramen. They're called directors of photography. Then you usually have an editor. And the director manages all those people to make sure they're getting what the clients kind of envisioned and also adding in a little creativity. But I do it all. So since I've eliminated like this, this need for like a big team and a lot of communication, I'm working with the client on set. So when they say something like, oh, you know, we don't want to describe this thing as a park because there's been too much community uproar. When I'm editing and someone says, we're doing a new park downtown, I know. I need right. to cut out that sound bite because right. right. I've heard them. So I just pick up on all this stuff and I manage the process all the way to the end, all the way to the Instagram videos and the screenshots. And that keeps it really efficient. And that keeps it consistent too. Architects love consistency. <laughs> you, you, you guys know that. How many, you know, how many architects are going to wear black to you know, the opening <laughs> of, a, of a museum show? Every one, every single one. So... You, you know, that consistency is really important. You want each shot to match. You don't want someone doing a handheld shot. Now someone's on a, a tripod. Now we're on like, you know, um, some type of other type of camera use. You don't want the mixed GoPro with a drone, right. with a really high-end 6K camera. Um, so that consistency like comes through and it feels like very professional and it feels like very um, clear. The storytelling is very clear because of that. Right. right? Right, right. So when you're going to, to shoot these things, <clears throat> you know, so you're going to shoot a building and then the day you're going to shoot the building and maybe uh, have an interview with an architect, uh, who's with you in terms of crew? I keep it pretty lean there. It's usually me, an assistant who does all my drone work, and then maybe an intern. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's two people, sometimes it's three. I have oh. an intern right now. I just did a shoot last week. We're doing a bunch of videos for San Diego Design Week. So I had an, a kind of an intern and then uh, kind of my drone DP guy that I've worked with for a long time, kind of like you think like a lead cameraman, and then me. And we jump in the bread truck and we <laughs> drive around. The bread truck's now a Toyota RAV4, 2019. I was going to say, you're still in the bread truck? <laughs> bread truck's gone, bro. Okay, okay yeah. You switch to something maybe safer and more fuel efficient. <laughs> bread truck's gone, man. When the, stu- when the studio went on strike and everything uh, shut down, I, I never saw it again. It disappeared. That <laughs> <laughs> thing was old and beat up, so I'm, yeah. I'm surprised it, it, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't run. But now we have a RAV4. 2019 RAV4 Adventure Series. So we jet all around and it's two to three person crew, usually two to three days shoot. Cool. Um, Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a project where, you know, you during um, the the, the scouting phase, it looks like it's going to go smoothly or maybe even before that you thought like, okay, this can be an easy building to shoot, right? But then when you get there, it ends up being much more challenging 
uh, because of maybe not because of weather or things like that, but just like the building itself end up being not quite what you anticipated once you get behind the camera. Yeah, that does happen. Sometimes they want you to film something like right as construction's wrapping up so that they can get it out for awards. And you may have an interior lobby that's all torn up mm. and you have to shoot around that. Uh, maybe the landscaping's not grown in or even planted yet. So you have to get your camera framed in a way to cut out certain parts of the building that just aren't done because they're, um, you know, they're submitting for an award and they want to show this project as soon as possible. Sometimes you have that stuff. Let me think, let me think what else you have. It's, just, it's interesting to me because there's, there's, you know, buildings are kind of perceived in a number of ways. And one of them is, is uh, through the human eye, you're walking around and seeing it and experiencing it, but then to capture whatever essence they're trying to capture through film or through photography is a completely different thing. And I've, I've, I'm, I'm just curious, maybe more about the relationship between like, um, how do I say it? Like some buildings when... You, you, some buildings I feel like you I, I could see I could think like okay this is gonna be easy to easier to photograph because there's a lot of cool curves or I don't know or whatever but when it comes time to shoot it it's like well this is not actually as exciting as as maybe I would have thought it to be I don't know if that mm. makes sense you know um it does make I mean you mentioned the curvy thing definitely makes sense like you try to shoot a Frank Gehry building it looks good from every angle mm -hmm. you know because you have this sculptural component that's kind of wrapping around the building so yeah you can sh shoot a very sculptural building all three days from all different angles because each angle is going to look sensual and cool whereas maybe a square building you know that front facade may be your best angle so you mm -hmm. may spend time on that front facade you may not shoot the back the back could be loading docks uh the back could be unattractive the side could be like some fire escape type thing so you so like a square building i guess is like a little easier to understand and you do it in the scout you kind of realize that you're like okay these are my two angles this one's best in the morning for light this one's best in the afternoon for light um but then if you get to a, a sculptural building like a frank gary building yeah you can you can just go at it on the curves because every <laughs> shot looks so sensual as far as a building like that you thought looked good and you showed up and it didn't look that great um i have had some stuff like that happen and i just need to really get good shots of the good portion of the building the good looking right. portion of the building. you only have three minutes it's not a 45 minute documentary you can fudge a lot of things uh by showing the strong angles and uh, inside now and, and then you can always cut to details you cut to details you cut to the architect drawing or sketching um which always is pretty cool to to, to compensate right 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 when you work on uh, on uh, on projects, architectural projects, how early on can um, like firms reach out to you to s start working on documenting those those projects? Hmm. Uh, yeah, good question. Sometimes it's when there's just a blank site. Sometimes um, developers reach out; they don't even own the land yet, but they want to put together a pitch video so that uh, they can either get funding or get community approval so that they can go forward with like purchasing the land. So the, I do architecture videos, which are kind of about the built project and how it impacts the community. And then I'll do developer videos, which is like how we're gonna improve this part of the city with a new plan, a new project. Either it's gonna be a new set of apartments and they wanna have a park in the front. So, um, there's a lot of rendering and a lot of visualization mixed in. So those early ones, sometimes we'll bring an animator on to do some really cool animations. My man, Dragon from Altitude Cam, that's his name, Dragon. <laughs> he is awesome. He'll do drone shots and then he'll build an animation on top of it, kind of growing out of the site. Oh. So sometimes we're on very early. Sometimes the projects uh, are going ahead and they want to film construction. Jonathan Siegel, who I worked with for years, I just love filming the construction process. So I may film three, four times over 18 months, you know, site work, uh, framing, interior details, a big old window being craned in. Um, sometimes it's, it's, uh, it is, that's important to them. That makes sense. I mean, this is a part of, of kind of the behind the scene and, and the story of the project before it gets mm -hmm. completed, right? That's pretty cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, what I tell my clients at the beginning is like, well, yeah, Jeff, we want to get a video. And the first thing I say is, okay, well, let's let's figure out what type of video you want. There's different types of videos. People don't think about that. I call mm. them story forms just because it's nerdy and architectural sounding. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, there's different types of story. There's a transformation story. So we're going to show this from an old gas station and we're going to film it being transformed in two years. This is going to be a beautiful, you know, mid-rise apartment with a park in the front and a Whole Foods on the bottom. We're going to tell that transformation story. Sometimes it's a poetry story. I filmed a chapel down in Point Loma, a beautiful chapel in a lilac field. So this chapel mm -hmm. is concrete, square, and it had little purple flowers all around it. I call that a poetry video because it's about the sounds and the sights, the music. It's about how you, it makes you feel, how evocative it is, light coming in. Architects don't even need to be in them. Uh, you don't have to have anyone from the community talking about how, yeah, this would be great to have this here. It's more about the poetry and the beauty of a, of a space. Then you have videos like an origin story. An origin story may be like um, some architect is innovating with new technology. They don't like the way that window blinds uh, are working, so they're inventing a new way to shade the outside of the building with a screen. And they're trying something brand new with these like metal louvers. And they want to talk about how there was this problem and now they're solving it. So there's an origin story. There's, um, there's also the problem solution story. Hmm. That's very common. Here we have a problem, you know, we have this freeway in downtown Los Angeles, a one-on-one, it separates, you know, the, the, the financial, the business side from the historic side. You know, people have to see this big freeway, it separates these two districts. So here's our solution. We're going to put a freeway cap over it and build a park so that people can leave Union Station, walk through this park and walk down to the museums down to the broad and down to the Walt Disney concert hall and have this great experience. So it's like a problem solution, pragmatic. So we try to identify like, what's the best story form. All right. What's the best type kind of like in Hollywood. You have a, you have a comedy, you have an action film, you have a documentary, you have a genre. Mm. Each film tells a specific type of story to a specific, specific audience. I so, would love to do a comedy architecture film. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you David, do that, but I would love, I think that'd be amazing. <laughs> David, I've done it. You yeah? got to yeah. put on your link. You want your viewers would love this. You got to put, I did a film for Brooks and Scarpa. They did a house in Chicago and I did it. I made it a parody of the, of the TV show unsolved mysteries. <laughs> so I have this year, I have this English voice narrating it. You know, it's kind of like a twilight zone. It's like an episode of Twilight Zone. He's created this brick screen in front of the building that twists. And people walk by, they're baffled by it because they can see in a little bit, but then they can't see in completely. The, bris the bricks are twisting up uh, in different angles. So people were literally stand in front of this guy's house and look inside this house. So I filmed people doing that, pointing at it, being confused. And I put this narration over of a Twilight Zone narrator talking about, you know, <laughs> what are these people looking at? What are they trying to make sense of here in Evanston, <laughs> Illinois, this small town? What are they seeing with the brick? And I have funny music in it. That's that's the comedy, man. All right, I'm going to have to get that link from you for sure. Yeah. Two and a half minutes of funny, <laughs> bizarre storytelling. <laughs> Uh, is there a particular project that that uh, you like to to shoot the most? A, a certain I don't I don't know what that means. It could be um, a type of architecture, a type of client, or type of anything. You know, it's 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 more it's more the architects. I just love working with Jonathan Siegel. Hmm. So you you guys know that name? Let me look him up. Yeah, check him out. He's known in the world of um, kind of multifamily housing. He 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 doesn't do museums or you know schools or campuses so he doesn't have a reputation of uh like doing all these different projects what he's done though is he's the architect as developer so he's developed a way where he owns the, the land he develops it himself he finances it and then he profits on it at the end so there's no there's no client so because uh -huh. of that this guy can talk so much about how architecture can be done clearly simply and beautifully without a client he doesn't have to worry about clients wow Actually, so oh, yeah, he, I know who he is. I mean, I knew him through through your work. Actually, he uh, was uh, he. There was a video on your site where I was talking about. I think it was a probably a a, a multifamily building. He talked about adding this giant 
or two giant one hundred thousand dollar beams to complete the form. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. by first yeah. I was like, how did he convince the client to do that? But I guess you've just answered the question. <laughs> it's awesome, David, because he'll talk smack. I'll, I'll interview him and I'll be like, Jonathan, could a client have ever done this? No, a client would never have done this. They would never have done poured concrete. It's too expensive. They would have never done floor to ceiling glass. They can't afford it. It's too, it, you know, it's too radical for them. The architecture is too pure. So he'll go off on, on, on the watering down process that happens between when an architect designed it and, and a builder gets it in his hand and starts managing the budget by cutting things back. Very interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's awesome. There's very few people in architecture like that who can operate like that. So I love filming him because he's got a freedom about him. He's got a, he's got a, a pureness, a clearness to his buildings. I can get on site, film them during construction. He owns them. It's no big deal. His son and his family work with him. I've filmed and interviewed his son. His daughter's an artist. Mm. I've done things with him. So I just love working with him because uh, he does awesome buildings and he does one a year. So he keeps me busy. Mm. You know, some architects take years to get some concrete and glass. You know, you think about a concrete and glass museum quality project. Mm -hmm. Some architects may do one or two their whole year, uh, their whole career. He's doing one every year. That's insane. So, so you're also the one doing the interview when you do like the architecture firm profile videos. Um, how did you, I mean, that's like a different approach, right? Than just like shooting a building outside the cinematography. It's, it's people, skills and relationship and how to get them to talk like, you know, like the way they actually are. So it comes out <laughs> like natural authentic, and authentic yeah. right like how much yeah. how much work did that take and was that something that you've always been interested in too that's the very insightful um observation marina <laughs> is, is to is to think about the fact that these people aren't naturally sitting at their table giving us profound sound bites mm -hmm. after right. sound bites about their building um, that's something I had to learn along the way. Uh, I was always good at framing up a building, shooting it at the right time with tilt shift lenses. Cinematography was always great, but I never quite knew the directing side where you're asking people in question, questions with intention. Right. You want them to answer something intentionally in a specific way. So that took some time. A lot of it's communication, like you said, a lot of it's people skills and a lot of it's energy and my personality. When I come to an interview, I try to get excited and passionate about what they've done. And then the architects will come back with passion and excitement when they answer the questions. It's called mirroring. Right. So they mirror my excitement. And I'm generally enthusiastic about their work. So I may you know, say, tell me about this stone sink that you built here. Where did you get that? I've never seen anything like that. And then they'll go into it and I'll say, man, that must have not been easy. That looks like that's a one of a one original thing. Then they'll talk about the challenges behind it. So in an interview, you want to get a few points. You want to get, number one, like where's the site and the location? You have to have that, right? Is it in downtown San Diego? Is it in a forest? Is it in Portland? Second of all, you have to let the audience know, like what's the building used for, the functions? You know, is this a school? Is this, some of that's obvious in the visuals, so you don't have to get too deep into that. But then what you want to get is you want to get a bit of conflict in. You want to find out what was hard about this project. Did it take them 15 years to build? Was it, you know, uh, a 10 story, you know, wood building at one point, And now it's like, you know, a three story stucco building. What happened there? What was the process? Was it, you know, really difficult to build this in a neighborhood? Maybe it's a historic neighborhood and they don't want a modern building. So how did you blend the old and the new? So you try to get a bit of conflict out of them. And, uh, and that's always a, that always propels the story forward. And then you try to get like a nice final closing thought, like about the future or about the impact. You know, what type of impact is this library going to have on the people of Durham, North Carolina? What type of impact will have this on? So you want to kind of end it with a, on a community note. And you, you do need to use your people skills to do that. I usually write the questions out ahead of time. None of this is like off the cuff. I, I plan out my talking points. I'm, I'm to the stage now, most documentary filmmakers are, where I say, I want to, him to talk about why this is a concrete cube. So I'll write in a question ahead of time, you know, tell me why you chose to use concrete instead of stucco. So I know what I want him to say. And then I write a question to provoke that response. Gotcha. That sounds like a lot of like prep work. 
<laughs> I mean, I mean, no, but that makes sense because you do want to assure that you're going to end end with a, a good end result, right? Like you say, you don't want to just improvise and hope for the best. You do have to do some due diligence and planning ahead of time. I'll I'll tell you, Marina, the way a video comes out feels totally natural. The way it is filmed <laughs> is totally unnatural. I will have them repeat things. I'll say, say it this way, huh. say it that way. You know, I'll have them do it again. I'll say, hey, the audience may not understand, um, you know, because, you know, sometimes they don't think about the audience. I'll say, right. we may have an audience from New York that may not understand why Pershing Square is this, like, important park. Right. Why don't you tell me about the transportation station and the different districts that flank it, mm. that really make it this, like, hub between these different neighborhoods in downtown Los Angeles. So that I have them rephrase it, I have them re-say it. Sometimes I'll kind of suggest what to say. You know, maybe they're kind of struggling getting it across, and I'll say, "Hey, let's just keep this really simple, guys. I just need one sentence. I need to, I need you to say that. You know, uh, my my hope for this building is that it, it brings the entire community of Costa Mesa together at this library, and then they kind of recycle that a little bit in their own words. Right. So I'll guide them and I'll direct them, but I'm very clear on what I need for editing. And I don't let the interview over until I have all the pieces I need. Cause I yeah. want, I want them to look good and sound good. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. I don't, I don't let it just kind of go off. So the interview process is so unnatural. We have two cameras on you. We have lights, we have a microphone hanging above you. You're, you know, usually you have models built up around your desk where you don't even sit but we wanted to film there because it had a better background and we put all the models there, uh, but it feels so natural and we put the markers in front of you and the sketch paper. Uh, truth is, is this, this may be, it may be like a, a storage room or something, someplace you, would <laughs> never, someplace you would never be, but it had great lighting and it was quiet. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna have you go over there for the moment. Um, and I can, you know, you'll see on Instagram the behind the scenes photos. It's there could be a lot happening. Sometimes it's really loose and I just, I interview someone on the street. I put a mic on them real quick and just go handheld and say, you know, you know, you know, how do you feel about this, this, this park and this building and, and get a quick bite. But a lot of times you want to craft these things to make them consistent and beautiful. I love it. I like that. I like that you're clearly thinking about this thing from so many different perspectives at once, because as you said, you're, you're the kind of the one person who's doing a bunch of things. So you're thinking about, you're thinking about the lighting, you're thinking about, I mean, even the content, you know, like, okay, yeah, but not everyone's going to understand what you're saying. So we have to kind of think about it from this other perspective. That's great. Yeah. I'm constantly having them rephrase things. Uh, you know, um, someone may mention someone and I'm say, Hey, you know, why don't you talk about the team instead of saying you and Luis, came up with right. this big design thing because right. the audience won't, won't know Louise. <laughs> Who the fuck is Louise? <laughs> Who's Louise? You know, someone in, you know, Belgium could be watching this. Yeah. And, you know, it's just like, why don't you just rephrase that and say like you and your team or like sometimes they'll put a date on it. They'll be like, yeah, in 2018, you know, we got approval on this. And I'll be like, let's not date it because someone can watch this in three, four years and that yeah. feels old. Mm -hmm. uh, it feels outdated. So just say, you know, when we got our approval, you know, we were ecstatic and we started building right away. So I'm constantly guiding them. And, and at the end of it, they really appreciate, I think they always really appreciate the fact that I'm investing so much energy into making sure they sound good and they're saying it pr properly so that when the audience is judging them, they come across as, 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 as put together, smooth, compelling, and then, you know, a lot happens in editing too. I edit out the dead spaces. When someone answers a question, you ask them something like, okay, so you're building this in, let's say downtown San Diego. How does this, like, why is this important to like connect to the public transportation on one side and the community college on the other side and you're building these apartments in the middle? Typically the beginning of their answer is really good. The middle, they go off on a tangent mm -hmm. and they start talking about something else. And then the end's usually good. Hmm. So when they give me that two minute sound bite, the beginning and end, I usually take, I cut out the middle and put them together and it comes out like they said it perfect. Oh man. I always thought these people were so good. I was like, <laughs> I have so much work to do. <laughs> they so articulated. Yeah. You know? Don't believe it. Don't believe the hype. It's Hollywood. <laughs> Hollywood. It's Hollywood editing. I'm telling you, Marina, I have gotten so good. I will have a 20 minute interview. I may get a sound bite that they said on minute one. I may get a soundbite from minute 13 
and a sound bite from minute eight and cobble those together to make this like ultimate clear sounding sound bite wow. so that the audience feels like they said it all in once but they said them two they said them totally different times um but you know communication is big you want these stories to be clear you want the audience to understand yeah. everything yeah. in three minutes so i've gotten good at it it's a lot of work splicing things together mm. i feel like an open heart surgeon yeah. getting in there sometimes taking one word here one <laughs> word there and trying to like splice it so like it all sounds like really natural um but you know the audience is like judging you and if something comes off that's it's, whether you stuttered or you slurred or you didn't say something properly um you know that you you you'll be thrown off by that you can't have it yeah yeah and i guess the audience is you know they're, they're very perceptive to all of the small things you know it could be like you said just one stutter one pause that's all it takes to send the wrong message or for people to be totally confused or to now. and no now they're thinking about something else instead of what you want them to be thinking about yeah you lose the momentum mm -hmm. you lose you lose the you know the the, the energy of what they're bringing if they don't say something you know in in a clear way right uh maybe it's confusing maybe instead of uh, like you know they're telling a transformation story but instead of saying transformation they say change like we wanted to change the campus you know it was an old campus and we wanted to change it and update it i'm like uh, let's do that again but let's say the word transform just because mm -hmm. i yeah. think it's a little more powerful and you know they're happy that I, that i that i pay attention to those details and uh you know and kind of have them have them in their best light hmm. i do wanted to ask about drones uh i mean let's be honest uh it's like the thing now that like every <laughs> single like developer or or property selling uh website will have when mm -hmm. did that really like become a thing and and I do actually think that it is very pertinent to like architecture documenting because it is like the plan view of, of buildings and you can see things from definitely a different perspective. I just feel like sometimes it's maybe overused or not used in the right way. Huh. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I hear you on that. You know, um, drones are cheap. Drones are easy to get. Everyone in an architecture firm has a drone now. Yeah. You know, you can go get a Mavic for $800 from Best Buy. And it shoots 4K video and takes photos. You do need to be licensed, but it's kind of an unregulated area. You know, if you're not licensed, you can still get up and fly and get a shot. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So drones. Let's see. I got down with drones right when they started coming out. So about 10 years ago, on one of Jonathan Siegel's first projects, he has a home in La Jolla called Cresta. I got these guys who were doing a drone. My friend Sam was able to put a camera up on an octocopter so that has eight blades you put a regular video camera on it it didn't have a built-in camera back then and you get these <laughs> you know perspectives looking down right. you see the neighborhood you see how the building connects to streets and sidewalks so there's like a lot of good information you you get from there and we were kind of like leading the way and using them with architecture because we kind of had this filmmaking background so we knew how to get video with them then we'd get photos with them and uh and now everyone does have them you're right and if you're not a good storyteller it's easy for you to cut three or four drone shots together in a row and it feels very repetitious uh i try to use drone shots in a very select way i try to build you up with some tripod shots something on the ground and then boom hit you with a nice drone shot and never try to put two or three drone shots in a row so mm -hmm. yeah. it doesn't get boring it doesn't get repetitious here's another angle from a drone here's another angle then i go back to the interview so i use them um marina like in a way where i can get the most power from them right right and it may be three drone shots in th in, in, a, in you know three 10 second drone shots i may sit on a drone shot for 20 seconds because they're usually really long shots you're rolling as you're like you know, tracking up from a building, you're going 100 feet, 200 feet, 300 feet, 400 feet. That may be a 20, 30 second shot. Maybe you want to leave that shot up there, put some text on the screen and really make the audience like look at it and feel it. Uh, but I try and, you know, I, I do want to know what you're saying. There, there's a real estate drone aesthetic. I'll say it. I'll say, you know, I, when I work with real estate clients, they want that fine. I'll give it to them. You get a nice orbit, you know, it's called an orbit shot. You go around the building 360 degrees, you, right. you, you know, you track it, you see it from different angles. Uh, if that's what they want, no problem. But when it comes to storytelling, I try to like really make that an exclamation uh, mark 
for whatever I'm saying by really hitting you with it instead of having it sprinkled in consistently. How much of your work right now is, uh, you know, for architecture offices where you're doing footage of the building and then an interview, that that kind of uh, package versus, uh, you know, real estate developers versus uh, something else? Even landscape architects. Do yeah, you, sure. yeah. yeah, yeah. I got, a, I got a cool project with the landscape firm I'm working on now, um, Office of James Burnett. Hmm. And uh, it's kind of about the future of workspace. You know, it's hard to say, David. Each month is different. I may be on a developer project for two or three months and not even do anything with architecture. I would say at the end of the year, I usually have maybe more design driven videos than anything else. Maybe that's 60%. Hmm. Then I have um, a mixture of kind of corporate and architecture development commercial videos is that other 40%. Or maybe 30%, maybe there's like a nonprofit in there, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. you know, kind of like a Woodbury or like AIA or, you know, I'm doing something for the Mingay Museum in San Diego on Design Week. So it's, 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 it's three buckets. It's nonprofit, trying to make the world better with design, museums, organizations, uh, developers who are kind of trying to get a community excited about their project. Those are usually bigger budget, longer shoots. And then it's kind of architects that are uh, that want a mini documentary on their firm or on a, a certain thing that they want to be known for, like sustainability, or they just want to have like a great video on a building they just did to show um, clients for interviews or for awards. So it's kind of those three that are broken up. Design's kind of the main thing right between uh, that connects them all. Right. It's like, I'm going to film the design. We're going to film the architect, whatever it is, whether it's Pershing square, whether you're selling some high end, you know, million dollar condos or whether you're an architect doing a library, it's all going to be about design is, is the core. And then p- the people behind it. And the, go ahead. Yeah, go for it. I know. I was going to ask uh, about more technical things in your equipment. So oh, what kind of, what? <laughs> <laughs> so what kind of equipment are you using? Um, I mean, I saw, I think on Instagram, you were, doing some something with a the red uh, camera which i don't know how much those cost but it's like a very serious the piece bank. of equipment <laughs> it's like it's David, tens of thousands of dollars right <laughs> yeah the big bank you know we rent a lot of high end equipment i own sony dslrs uh, like a sony a7s3 and two, that's what I do a lot mm. of my shooting on just because it allows me to move quickly i could put a tilt shift lens on it and it's full frame, so it gives you that wide vista mm-hmm. for that. So a lot of the shooting is Sony DSLRs and a drone is kind of the the, the two main the two main uh, tools. But yeah, I'll rent a Red Epic 8K if I have a project that needs to be really high resolution. Those are like forty five thousand dollar cameras. <laughs> um, I just rented a Sony. You know, that's kind of my film nerd side, like the Hollywood side. Right. You know, uh, I know about high-end cameras from Hollywood where a lot of architectural photographers are getting into video, but they've never been on the high-end high end production side, so they may not have experience. So I'll, I'll rent high-end stuff. I just rented a camera, uh, Canon C500. It's a 6K camera, and it is beautiful. It was full frame. My Canon tilt shift lenses look gorgeous on it. I shot a bunch of stuff last week. I went into this guy who has this old letterpress shop so imagine old wood walls it smells like your grandfather's garage oil <laughs> old machines he's putting type on a block and, and 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 pressing it down on business cards to make high-end stationary really beautifully designed letterpress invitations business cards stuff we did pre-digital so i wanted to shoot it in this like really warm way so i use different lenses and i use this like canon has great color for that so depending on the budget I get, that kind of gets the, that kind of de- determines the camera system. Mm. How do you keep up with all of the new equipment coming out and your software, you know, editing software? Like, right. how do you- Marina, <laughs> amount of time I spent watching uh, camera review videos. <laughs> <laughs> if I spent that on business development, I'd be as rich as Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> I just watched one this morning. I watched another 20 minute review. You know, you watch a lot of reviews and then you rent stuff is how it happens. Uh, yeah. In this constant cycle of renting high end stuff, 
testing it, using it, renting it again. It's a lot of work, you know? I wish I had the money to just buy these things. I don't want to need to keep testing them, but if you rent them, you keep up to date on the latest stuff. And yeah, you, you put a lot of time into it. Like uh, when I render, typically, and you'll know this, were you guys ever in the 3D rendering side of things in architecture? Uh, very, very little, but yeah, we, yeah. I mean, we're not experts, but we do, we do know a little bit of it. Yeah, so you know, it takes time to render something out. Once oh, yeah. it's all like modeled and stuff, sometimes it takes a minute or two yeah. to produce like a high resolution JPEG. It could take like, you know, it could take, 10, 15 minutes to produce like an animation or it could take 24 hours. So when I'm rendering and exporting these videos, that's when I hop on and quickly see what Canon's coming out with or what Sony's coming out with. <laughs> right. you know, uh, yeah. yeah. So I mix it. It's part of my workflow. Like learn, I'm a big lifetime learner. I've always loved learning. My brain's always out there uh, wanting to learn how architects think, how a director is, is, is looking at cinema. So I do enjoy the learning aspect of these like camera reviews and seeing people like with low light and setting something up and how they light it and how they shoot this person against a black background. So I enjoy that aspect of it and that keeps me engaged enough to stay up on, on top of, of what's coming out. So for the camera reviews for at the high end level, are they generally be generally, you know, better quality reviews? Uh, uh, because at the prosumer level, there's a lot of really shit reviews out there. <laughs> and it's so like YouTube is this amazing resource, right? But it's like impossible to find a decent review of, you know, again, prosumer, consumer grade stuff. It's always like yeah. unboxing or the, the like reading you the stats from BNH like yeah but this is not a review <laughs> yeah it's it's like your little brother you know <laughs> saying look i got a drone and i think people are going to follow me if i open this drone up yeah. and <laughs> put the battery in yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> if, if someone sees me put the battery in, i'm going to get that you know you you follow people i follow people right. on youtube that are pro working professionals like myself mm -hmm. so i don't i don't get bogged down with all the garbage out there I go to the high end people that I know can give a solid review in about 20 minutes and I follow them and I follow them on Instagram and they'll put up something like, Hey, new review on slow motion with the new Canon C C300, 120 frames. So I follow these high end people and I follow very specific reviews. And when I got a, cappy, uh, a camera uh, I'm happy with for a year, I may not bother checking out reviews. I yeah. may, you know, when I got my little Sony DSLR, I went two, three years with it and didn't, didn't get sucked down into the camera world. It's only when you want to upgrade and like a bunch of new stuff's coming out now, like they're, they're going higher than 4K, they're going 8K, mm -hmm. you know, Canon's coming out with 8K. Then you got to get back into like the learning cycle right. and like learn what's out there. So, you know, I, I rented a Red Epic and I got to tell you, you know, uh, most people think it's a great camera, and it is for an actor and a crew, but the film architecture, I find it to be not a good camera for architecture. Hmm. It's not a low-light camera, so when the building's lit up at night and you have that blue sky, you want to see those dusk shots. Mm -hmm. It wasn't great at that. It's not great at straight lines. You know, It's better for an actor's face where there's no straight lines, You know, where you can see the curvature. But when you huh. want these straight, sharp lines, crisp lines of a skyline or a building or something boxy, that's not its strength. Interesting. And it's, a, it's a bit more grainy. It's more cinematic. You know, it's trying to emulate film. So, uh -huh. you know, watching a movie that was shot on it is great, but I found it wasn't great for architecture. So that's, that's, that's something you learn by doing these tests and by shooting things. Interesting. Do you have any uh, like side project, like more personal film that you're working on? If you, you have know, any I, time left <laughs> in the week. <laughs> yeah. Um, every year I'll do two or three personal films. So um, the one I did last year, which I really love, is there's a firm in San Diego called Carrier Johnson. They did this beautiful concrete chapel in a lilac field. I talked about it yeah, a, yeah. a while ago. And, you know, they didn't hire me to do it. I knew them. I knew the principals. I kind of saw it on Instagram and I said, wow, that is such a beautiful building. I would love to film that. I just said that on Instagram. Some guy responded and said, yeah, Jeff, we love your work. You know, do you want to help out? So I'll jump on personal projects when there's not a budget, but there's just a beautiful project um, that I'm passionate about. It was just gorgeous. The music it was down by the Pacific Ocean. You had this kind of 
you know, brown sand bluff and you had this brown concrete, you know, so it kind of all tied together with the, the landscape. And I filmed it for like four months, four, four to six months. Oh, wow. So I saw the seasons change. I saw this, this purple lilac fill up the field around it. Then I saw the flowers gone and it was all green around it. I saw the, the winter light coming through and I just took it on as a personal project because I was just fascinated by it. I thought it was really pretty. And I made a really nice, beautiful film, took some photos. They loved the film. It led to a relationship where they hired me to work on another project with them. So things like that I'll do a few times a year, just pursuing buildings I love and doing my own thing. That, that's kind of it. And then I'll help other filmmakers. So this year I got to help a, an awesome filmmaker in, in Southern California who, wanted, who did this really high-end Star Wars film. He did a short fan film. I don't want to call it a fan film because that makes it sound like some amateur thing. But he did this beautifully well-crafted 10-minute film with actors and a script, uh, a new story of Star Wars. He wanted to develop a new world, and we filmed it out in the Mojave <laughs> Desert. Whoa, wow. And I just worked with him, and I just supported him and his team just as kind of like a second set of hands just to be around acting again, lighting, directing. You know, uh, science fiction is something – architects are always fascinated by that's their favorite genre you know blade runner think about it you gotta, <laughs> you gotta love blade runner man don't oh, hate yeah. on blade runner <laughs> you gotta love the old one and the new one that's uh, yeah. so you know i had just helped out with it you know helped the actors you know get ready got the wardrobe they needed supported the camera crew whatever lighting they needed so i'll help out with other productions just to learn and be part of it like i said most of these film projects are only a few days mm. so i can go work on star wars for like six or seven days with this um awesome little team and then i can go shoot something myself for a few days and that's kind of how i do my personal work okay. is that star wars film out are they what not are yet name? okay <laughs> not yet let us know <laughs> yeah yeah you'll see it don't worry if you follow me on instagram i'll, I'll bury you guys with, with content good. awesome about it they're doing a whole visual effects thing so they, wow. they got the bad guy built out and visual effects and there's a big battle so it's going to take like a solid year oh, wow. we filmed it in february wow. so i think they're at, i think they're about the halfway point so it's going to take probably the rest of this year doing all the visual effects you know it's going to be blade runner it's going to be like blade runner meets star wars the way the director's vision with this film noir this darker look these atmospheric frames where there's atmosphere we had big smoke machines out in the desert. It was awesome. We had to smoke these things out. They had lightsabers uh, going. Um, so it's it's pretty cool, and it'll probably be out next year at some point. You'll see it on my Instagram when things start to uh, premiere. Cool, cool, cool. cool. So and, um, I also saw that you've been kind of going out and about a little bit, um, as, as much as you can these days, I suppose, to uh, explore. You're down in San Diego, right? I live in San Diego and I have my office in Los Angeles. So I work oh. with the filmmakers in Los Angeles. Before pandemic, I was working uh, two, three days a week in LA. Mm -hmm. I would work up there. My brother lives up there in Culver City. Oh. And I just love the art and film community up there. Uh, but then we're living in North San Diego, about an hour and 15 minutes of outside of downtown Los Angeles. I always so, forget oh, San Diego is that close. close. I always yeah. think it's, it's northern. Yeah. It's right. northern San okay. Diego. Southern San Diego is like a good two hours okay. away. Uh, but where uh, uh, San Diego goes all the way up along the coast, mm -hmm. uh, it grew up, it grew kind of along the coast instead of inland like Los Angeles. So up in like Oceanside, I mean, you know, I've gotten to downtown LA in an hour flat wow. if I leave at, you know, whatever, 10 o'clock. Um, and then I'll stay up there and then I've lived up there and, and I have family up there. So I just love working with the people up there I, and being creative with that group of people. Uh, and then I find it easier, especially during the pandemic to be in San Diego near my mom. So she can kind of watch the kids and I can keep working cause the kids are out of school now. So I've kind of adopted this like kind of two city situation and I have clients from both. And I think it's it's really awesome to see the differences between the two different cities. Hmm. Do, you, do you get a lot of clients that are non-local? You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, throughout the year, I'll end up in Seattle. I'll end up in North Carolina. I'll end up in the Bay Area. I'll end up in Chicago. Uh, people from podcasts will hear me. 
hmm. uh, talk and then they'll reach out and say, Hey, we, we need someone to document this. And it's up in, you know, Bellevue, Washington. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I would say like a good 70% is California based, sure. Northern and Southern, and then probably 30%, maybe the clients in California, but the project somewhere else. So you end up going to different cities. Maybe their team is in Denver, uh, but uh, someone in California hires me. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I got to go to Denver twice last year. I got to go to North Carolina, spent a week in the Bay Area in Tahoe, which was awesome. So with COVID locked down, like I have, this is the first time I've been at home <laughs> this many dinners with my kids, <laughs> and, you know, in a row in a long time. I was all set to go to Portland. I had trips. I would have been like all, all over the country again. Yeah. But now it's just kind of Cal- Southern California is kind of how it's been the last month as, as things have come back. Right, right, right. The last thing I was wondering, is there a, a project uh, type that you haven't uh, shot or worked on yet that you want to? Or a client. <laughs> or a client. <laughs> hmm. Man, that's a good question. That's a good question. Let me think about what I've done here. I love filming custom homes because they have like the highest level of design. Mm. Right. Because that's where people really care. I love filming like, you know, the things in the urban core that are about community, like museums, libraries. And I've done quite a bit of those. What haven't I done that I would like to work on? You know? That's a good question. Um, you know, maybe a large scale landscape project. Hmm. I haven't done anything like that. Like maybe something in China, you know, where they're do they're doing like an entire new city hmm. and it's, it's like master plan kind of more planning. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't done that. I think that'd be fascinating to spend a week there filming all the different aspects of like a, a big built plan in, in a big city that had landscaping, you know, like a, maybe a carbon neutral, uh, development or something that was just had a really big, bold vision. This is what gets me, you know, there's talking about building a Bitcoin city out in the Las Vegas <laughs> desert, uh, you know, filming something like that, I think would be really intriguing. I haven't done that yet. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, well, if it happens, let us know. <laughs> we'll chat again. David, you didn't ask me the main question. What's the main question? What everyone asked me. What's the difference and similarity between film and architecture? <laughs> All right, what is the difference between <laughs> film and architecture? <laughs> I mean, we we, we kind of covered that indirectly, but that's a question like people always ask right at the beginning. You want to know? All right, I'll just give it to you brief because we've covered a lot, and it, it was kind of buried in there. So I think at their core, film and architecture are different. Film is telling you a story to entertain you. Architecture is more about like housing a function for human behavior, creating a vessel for it to happen. It's a place for you to live, place for you to learn, place for you to work. You can have a building tell a story and some really high-end museums and galleries do do that. But generally a building telling a story is not its top priority. Hmm. So they're like very different. But they definitely come together in a lot of ways outside of that. You know, great movies, the city plays a character. You know, the city is a backdrop, whether it's Boston, you know, and Ben Affleck's movie, The Town. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, you think of those early movies of, um, you know, of Metropolis, of course, uh, the, even like, you know, Citizen Kane, where they show him he's at Xanadu and that's his house. And then he's in New York. You know, the character can really play like a store, uh, a strong, uh, the, the environment can play a strong character in a film. Right. Uh, so you have that. But you also have kind of like a connection in the editing. The way that you move through a building from one space to another is similar to like the scenes of a movie. So here's the different scenes of a movie. And then the latest one that came up as I was on a run on Tuesday, I was like, all right, I think David's going to ask me this. I better have a few fresh hands. <laughs> so I'm on a run and I'm thinking, here's my latest one. Here's my newest, my newest similarity. So when you have a film, you have a performance. You have a performance between, uh, with an actor and they're playing a character. And you're trying to communicate the emotions of what this character is going through to an audience. So the way a director does that is the director will have the characters express outward, like they're interacting with people. You know, here's a woman talking to her kids. There's a cop talking to a bad guy. They're communicating and exchanging. 
then the bad guy leaves, then you show that character kind of looking out the window and now you, you're, you're showing their inner world, mm-hmm. right? And how they're reacting to what they just heard. Maybe someone just told the Joker, you know, that, you know, their program's closing down and they're not going to give him his medicine anymore. So the next shot's the Joker like out, like looking out through a window. He's mm-hmm. showing how he's reacting to that. And I think those those two levels of character are really clearly defined, the outer world and the inner world. Hmm. And I think that really matches architecture because architecture is broken into two types of spaces, interior space and exterior space. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this week's episode. And if you like what we're doing, please consider leaving us a review in the podcast app. I know I ask for this every week. And that you're is... like, stop asking for it. Yeah. No, but, but that's the only it. really the form of way. exchange and the best way to support us and help us continue on with this journey, right? And, 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 and in turn, it helps us build some kind of, uh, you know, credit street cred so that when we go and ask architects or other designers to be on the show they're like oh yeah okay you have a lot of good reviews um uh so we're obviously on itunes we're on also spotify and youtube and we're on all the social medias right yeah social media we have a facebook page uh facebook group Uh, we're on instagram we're on twitter and of course you can find most of our interviews and recordings on our youtube channel so please subscribe Mm-hmm. And leave us comments, any questions, any comments. reaction you want to have to any of the videos that are out there. Uh, feel free to let us know. <laughs> Always love seeing comments and questions and feedbacks. Um, we got one comment on a video clip from a while ago. It was a fairly, it, w- it was, I wouldn't say it's provocative, but we were talking about masturbation as art. And and consequently, <laughs> that gets a lot of uh, more clicks than, 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 than others, right? So, but that video clip was from like a year ago and we got a comment on it like the other day I saw. <laughs> someone's like this is not fucking art who are these sick people i'm like well i'm pretty sure it is art okay uh, it's debatable <laughs> it's debatable um anyway so we're on all of those reach out to us if you have any suggestions and etc we really appreciate you listening it means a lot to us and yeah. we also have the hotline yeah hotline. you can shoot us a text message leave a voicemail don't worry we won't pick up it goes straight to voicemail hmm. number is 213-222-6950 uh, if you have any questions any guests you want to suggest to see in the show send it our way send it our way yeah all right thanks everyone for listening and we will talk to you again next week or sooner thanks bye bye bye